I will talk mainly uh, from my perspective as a landscape architect uh, to look at green cities and at greening. So I will first talk about why I praise nature. We've often skirt the concept of nature and don't spell out nature exactly. Or sometimes nature is reduced. These are the issues I would like to tackle. And then I will um, take you to three projects in Iraq and in Lebanon, where we've used, uh, we've looked at green, greening cities in, in, on a regional metropolitan scale. Uh, and as always, I have a lot of slides, so you will excuse me, I will whiz through them. So first, urban nature, a landscape framing to look at nature. For sure, WHO a while back recognized the need for nature in cities, and mainly because we need to be in contact with, with the nature to understand it, to appreciate it, and it has quantified this with a criteria of so many nine generally square meters per inhabitant in cities. And cities range from under one square meter, as in Beirut and in Damascus, to two to 30 or more. So there is a very big diversity. But mainly it's cities, because that is where nature is most needed and where nature has generally disappeared. And the concepts that uh, David spoke of this morning on green cities, Rockefellers, resilient cities, eco cities, are all in a way, even if, if it's implicit, trying to bring nature back into our cities through sustainable practices. Um, uh, I think that this, I like this diagram by uh, the father of landscape ecology, Zev Nave who shows that in truth, nature, there is really no nature in the world we live in today. There's more natural and there's less natural. And it's on a continent from the more natural, natural landscape, semi-natural, semi-agricultural, agricultural, all the way to the most urbanized, urban landscape, which is really, this is also a a scale of sustainability, which is also the least sustainable. So what happens to nature in cities? Many things happen. But mainly, as the city, the urban footprint expands and grows, it eats up its peripheries. This is uh, uh, from Damascus, a project I, we worked on the master plan. And Damascus has a, a halo, the green that you see, of what is called as the ghuta. And it is an incredibly uh, unique agricultural productive uh, landscape which encircles the city. But as you can see, progressively the city grows and eats into the Ruta. So this is a little bit nature at the periphery. One of the first times I was faced with this question as what is the natural heritage of a city was in a UNESCO um, initiated project in Beirut in 2020, asking for uh, 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 following the Beirut uh, blast with the explosion that happened. So we, uh, UNESCO wanted to look at um, what, are, what is the criteria to classify natural and cultural heritage. Well, cultural heritage, of course, the architecture and its typology was very well recognized, what was nature? So this is when I realized that there are really two natures, two, two views of urban nature. In the first column, the natural heritage is what I call the nature of cities. It is the terrain, it is the river, the sea, it is the, a woodland maybe. So it's the basic uh, site upon which the city was established. And another is the nature in cities, which is really the fragments of what remains of nature. And, um, and although we looked at institutional green areas, we looked at uh, um, 
remnant orchards from the 19th century. Very little was left, but these are more or less the green spaces that were identified and we found environmental formulas to calculate the benefits. Really. But nature is much more than just green. And we heard this in the morning. Nature is really about cycles. It's about uh, the sea, view of the sea. It's about a river and the flooding. So all of these are nature. This is nature with a capital N. But unfortunately, it's been reduced to green spaces. Yes, there is nature in green spaces, but it's not only that. So what has happened, uh, I feel, is that and a lot of us, before me, Dr. Ali spoke of indigenous, and so did David earlier on. Uh, previously, before really the early 20th century, uh, towns and cities were in a very close relationship with nature, with the region, with whatever nature existed there, whether it was desert or forests or marginal landscapes. What happened is that with the 20th century split, suddenly we were cut off from nature and we became much more insular, looking within the city and only at the city. Uh, speaking as uh, a vice president and member of the International Federation of Landscape Architects, landscape is often thought of as the profession that does beautification, urban beautification, but it is much more than that. And here we have James Hayter, the pre previous president talking about the scope, climate change, food security, community practice, health, well-being, indigenous culture. All of these are issues dealt with by landscape architects. Uh, but again, we have another problem in our region, uh, namely landscape. There is, as of yet, no word for landscape in Arabic. Uh, and the 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 dictionary translation is really outdated, a natural scene. So it's visual and it's natural. But what happens is that I, I like this slide from Dubai because if you ask people on the street, what is nature? I mean, what is landscape, sorry? It would be that part. But nobody would think of the amazing garth trees that are ecosystems on their own. But that wouldn't be landscape. I mean, the landscape is only what is in the lower part. And this is the problem we really uh, need to deal with. So within this expansive scope of landscape that we've adopted in our profession, landscape is very rich because it is both tangible, what we see, what we can touch, but it's also intangible values and cultural perceptions. And uh, so in a sense, I all often say that landscape is the face of nature and environment, which are abstract concepts. So landscape is really the tangible, something that people can relate to. If you say riparian ecosystem, it doesn't really mean anything to people. But if you say a stream or a river and give it a name, then it is meaningful. And that is really, in a way, landscape. So I will take you through very quickly through three projects. I will, they are published and I've put references so I will not dwell on them. What I wanted to show was how different nature is in our part of the world and how uh, we can work with them. A lot of this David spoke of this morning, but these are actual projects that we worked with. So Medina al Nafil is a, uh, a new town uh, initiated by Basra uh, Governorate. And I worked with um, D1 Architects to develop the plan, the master plan for this new town. It is located at the tip of the Gulf, very close to where we are. And it is uh, along the Khor Abdullah, which is a saltwater inlet from the Gulf. And it's basically a tidal wetland. And uh, so the site is really very problematic. Uh, salinity is high, uh, water table is high, so there are many problems. But the master plan uh, uh, had to really, as a landscape architect, I wanted to build 
on the potential. There are limitations, but are also potential. So, for example, the wetland that you see here, where is the pointer? Is this the pointer? Trying to find the pointer. At the lower right, is not different from this image I took from the airplane of mangroves out of Abu Dhabi. So, really, uh, these were developed at the edge of Abu Dhabi as a nature reserve, as a very, very interesting and alive, you know, part of nature of that city, uh, as a bird sanctuary. So in the end, I, I was fighting with the, with the architects not to uh, build on this part, but rather leave it as a nature park for this new town. And these are some of the strategies that we developed, the architecture that we developed to enjoy this as a national park. Another was to build on native tree species, date palms. Basra is known for its date palms, and which date to Sumerian times. So to look at using date orchards again to green and to minimize green areas and lawns. Uh, we look, these are the layers of the city, and you can see from the bottom the actual nature uh, reserve, and, and then the edges of the water, and up to the green corridors that go through the town, and the top uh, layer is the shelter belts. And there we used, again, a uh, um, tree uh, planting, native trees that are I had researched in Baghdad using enclosures. It's a very uh, different approach to shelter beds. Uh, using the waterways, uh, again from Dubai, uh, to, for transportation. So again, to build on this potential. So this is like a model. The second example is very, very different in landscape. It's from the Kurdish region in North Iraq. And it's the Erbil Green Belt. And it is a, a very um, rich uh, landscape. It's Erbil, the citadel, is one of the oldest continually settled uh, 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 parts of the world. Uh, and the, uh, the, the site, as you can see uh, from the uh, GIS investigation, the terrain is relatively hilly but complex at the edges with a lot of waterways, a large network of waterways. And the green belt is the dark green. It was proposed uh, by Darren Henderson Master Plan. It's a fascinating landscape. The green belt was proposed for amenity purposes. And uh, the landscape has 23 villages, arable farming, uh, rain-fed farming, uh, pastoral lands, and the water courses. Uh, it is also a site of genocide uh, of the Kurdish people. And so there are a lot of uh, cemeteries where the villages have disappeared. Now, the client's vision, unfortunately, of a green belt is outdated. So basically, they said it's very easy. We're taking out the villages, we're evacuating the people, and we're going to plant it with forest shelter beds a mono, monochromatic um, landscape that is really senseless. So people and their villages were out. So our, and when I say our, this is with uh, Khatib and Alami, and it was a multidisciplinary team with horticulturists, with hydrologists, um, and a planner. We said, no, on the contrary, people are at the center, their livelihoods are the focus of the green belt, just as much as yeah, just as much you as trying to create amenity spaces for. Um, so we look to again to the layers of the, uh, the the master plan. Looked at agriculture, sustainable agriculture, uh, industrialized or or individual farmhouses, depending on the location within the green belt. We looked at two biodiversity spots uh, and forests, and we looked at reviving the waterways as uh, ecological corridors um, and bird sanctuaries. Iraq is a bird sanctuary. And we looked at shelter belts 
as an environmental protection uh, tool, uh, looking at cadastral and village shelter beds. And of course, the amenity landscape itself. Uh, the third project is from SAIDA, Sustainable uh, Development. This is a project that was EU funded. SAIDA is a very old town in, in southern uh, Lebanon, south of Beirut. And uh, it, it, uh, it has agricultural land. The team was, uh, uh, had different focal groups. We had cultural and myself as landscape, ecology, and environment. And we looked at the three, the water, urban agriculture, and urban green spaces. And this is the, one of the key problems we faced. The streams that come from the mountains of Lebanon down to the coast, uh, they are seasonal streams. And uh, they are known, and with, as water became less, they have been used as conduits for sewage. So the blue is really sewage network and not the water of them. And this is a practice throughout the Eastern Mediterranean that I have witnessed. So the key was to look at this and try to remove the sewage networks, recreate the riparian e ecology so that it is alive, to use it as a, a natural um, ecological corridor for amenity, but also for environmental purposes. We also looked at agriculture and the, uh, and the abandoned railway. And in the end, we created a multifunctional blue-green network. Parts of this have been refunded by EU, again funded, I mean, for another cycle to revive the rivers. And here I show the multifunctionality so that the water course looks at environmental health, socioeconomic benefits, landscape heritage, and so on. So to conclude, uh, landscape really can give a very good framing for reading uh, nature in cities and environment and uh, to develop solutions. The key uh, uh, principles I would like to conclude with is First of all, fluidity across multiple scales. Don't just think of city. City is part of a region, and you have to think of the city and the region. You cannot isolate it. You will never have sustainable solutions if you focus on the city only. So this is a, a very important part, to look, think of networks. A second is to look at integrating cultural and natural components uh, of green, which is from the Damascus Master Plan. The multifunctionality I spoke of, of in uh, Sidon, how to combine infrastructure and landscape. And finally, culture and place specificity. Look at the incredible um, landscapes from this part of the world, from, from, from the Middle East, and try to build on this. There was a reason for this. I conclude with this slide, which is really, as I said, nothing happens as we heard in the morning session without the collaboration of different disciplines. Uh, so we really have to do that because no one landscape can be a good framing and can offer solutions. But in reality, without the collaboration of agriculturists, horticulturists, agri agronomists, uh, hydrologists, planners, nothing will happen. Thank you.